It's time now for another edition of the Can Alta Hotels AJHL Coaches Show. I am Taylor Medic, and I'm pleased to be joined by Fort McMurray Oil Barons GM and head coach Tom Kekka. Tom, thanks a lot for taking the time to uh, join us here in Sherwood Park before a big game. Uh, down the stretch here in the regular season, you guys are uh, playing really well right now. Six wins in a row for you. Uh, just talk about uh, the success that you guys have had of late, uh, kind of peaking at the right time. Yeah, I think that's the key as a coach. You know, you go through your ups and downs uh, as a team and as an organization throughout the course of the year. But the goal for all of us is to make sure when March 8th hits that you're playing the best hockey that you possibly can. And, you know, we've definitely had streaks through the year where we've been really good. And there's also been streaks where we've been really poor. And, and right now we just happen to be on a little bit of a hot streak, riding a good goaltending, uh, some timely goals. Um, we've got a good road record uh, for us. And, and we're looking to make sure that we're, we're first of all healthy and, and that we're playing the best hockey we can when playoffs come. Yeah, right in the mix of things uh, when it comes to uh, a, a good home ice slot uh, in terms of the playoffs and you know trying to catch Spruce Grove for that uh, first round bye. Uh, let's dive right into your group right now. And you mentioned timely goals, and I think throughout the year you've gotten that from uh, the big guy in Will Conley. Uh, 40 goals on the year for him. Uh, just maybe talk about his progression as a player for you guys. You acquired him from Brooks a couple of years ago, and uh, really he's uh, a force to be reckoned with out there, it seems, sometimes with this Oil Baron team, committed to Holy Cross as well. So just touch on uh, the play of Colin, uh, Will Conley throughout the years. Well, you know what makes me look a lot smarter as a GM when we made that deal in my first year? We acquired him just before the December 1st deadline, and you know it was strictly a hockey deal at that point point where Brooks needed you know some some veteran guys and, and we were in a position where we knew that we needed to build for the future so Will came in as a as a young raw talent uh, we knew that he had a lot of uh, upside um, we always envisioned him being a big power forward I don't think I envisioned him scoring 40 goals and it was actually quite quite interesting because yesterday he scored his 40th in drum heller and they threw me the puck and I was like Okay, 40 goals, is that a milestone really? <laughs> Usually you, you equate 50 as, yeah. as a milestone, but you know what? As we look back uh, you know, in our history as an organization, I believe the last guy to score 40 goals for the four McMurray Oil Barons was Colin Murphy way back in the 2000, and that was you know a long time yeah. ago, a local boy that had 46, 47. So it makes you realize to score 40 goals yeah. in the Alberta Junior Hockey League is a huge accomplishment. And you know, Will uh, strictly does it based on speed. Um, he overpowers a lot of players, um, and we're very fortunate to have him on our team. I was going to ask, do you think he gets 50? I mean, you, you mentioned 40 is an accomplishment because it's been a while since someone scored 50. Mark Latestu uh, almost uh, over 10 years ago now. Uh, so two guys kind of in the running in the last 10 to 9 games and Chris Van Oshaw and Will Conley. Yeah, and both very similar players, both big, strong guys that have a great shot. Um, listen, if it gets closer, we'll obviously give him the ice time that he's going to need. But I, I think that, you know, again, Will is a, a team first type player for us. And while 40 is great and 50 would be awesome, it's about how the team is playing. So uh, he plays within our structure. He's really improved. I think the biggest thing for him last year was, uh, you know, obtaining the scholarship at the end of the yeah. year and going into your 20 year old year with that put sort of onto the side, knowing that he's going to Holy Cross. So now as a coaching staff, what we've done is we've challenged him on a daily basis. Okay, what are the little things that you have to do in order to be better at the next level? I mean, to be a good player in the Alberta Junior Hockey League is hard, but to be a good player at the NCAA, that's a huge step. So Will has really taken to heart um, his off ice training, um, the attention to detail, and, and I really think that he's been a very vocal leader for us. And I think that those are all attributes that he's going to need in order to be a, a big time player at the next level, because I do think he has that potential. Slew of veterans on this Oil Baron squad for you, uh, and you were a part uh, of making maybe two of the three biggest trades of the year uh, in the Alberta Junior Hockey League. Earlier on, you send uh, Ryan Cox here to Sherwood Park for Meredith Zitko, and then at the deadline uh, on January 10th, you acquire uh, Coy Prevost from the uh, Canmore Eagles. He was their captain. Just talk about those two players and, and, and what they've meant to your program so far and, and, and pulling the trigger on uh, two big deals. Yeah, the first deal with Mayor was was a very difficult um, trade at the time, and that was strictly a hockey trade. Yeah. And it was a we were at a point where we felt that um, the players in our room had a little bit more to give. Uh, we felt that we needed some type of change in the locker room, and Ryan Cro Cox was a is a phenomenal player, um, a great kid. But unfortunately, just we needed to make a move and shake up our room, and we felt that we've done that. Um, and it's benefited both organizations, which I think is the key when you're making a hockey trade. Now at the deadline, now you're looking at, um, you look at what your, what your team looks like, what your roster is, what you think you're going to need in order to compete in a very competitive North Division. And we felt we needed to get a little bit bigger, a little bit stronger, a little bit more sandpaper. So you know what? To be quite honest, uh, the call went to Andrew Mill and just off the cuff, I said, well, listen, what would it take to get Coy Prevost? And he said, well, you know, we really haven't thought about it. 
um, we got to talking and, and it, again, made another deal where it hopefully benefit, benefits us right now, but yeah. will benefit the Canmore Eagles in the future. And Coy's come in and, and, and it's, there's an adjustment period there. I think Coy being the captain and, and having to do everything in Canmore, um, now coming to an organization where, uh, and no disrespect to Canmore, maybe we're a little bit deeper where he doesn't have to do everything. Yeah. He's still trying to find his uh, position in our lineup, how he fits in the locker room, but he's a great kid. Um, and to be quite honest, probably a lot better than what even I imagined. I, I knew that he was a goal scorer, but he's he's got that sandpaper. He can play center. He plays wing. He kills penalties for us. So, again, uh, getting him accustomed to the way we do things in Fort McMurray has been a lot easier. Um, and he's going to play a huge role if we uh, want to have any success in the playoffs. You got a, a great crop of 98 born forwards as well, and one guy really contributing to your lineup is Reed Morrison. Uh, comes from the Kootenai Ice of the Western Hockey League, had some time uh, in the AJHL uh, early on in his career. But I want to ask you, how come some guys can make the the transition and create success for them at the at the junior A level, coming from major junior, and then some guys just don't? What do you see in Reed's game that uh, allows him to uh, to put up the numbers he has and contribute to your lineup? You know, as coaches, sometimes we use the word entitlement or the sense of entitlement yeah. quite a bit. And, and sometimes you get players that come from a higher level. They just assume that things are going to be a lot easier because it's tier two. It's not, you know, the Western Hockey League. Reed is a guy that just came and just wanted to play. And uh, he's a quiet kid. Uh, I didn't know how to take him really at first because I'm thinking, wow, you know, he's really quiet. He doesn't say too much. But that's just his personality. Um, he's delivered above and beyond what we've expected. Um, has scored some very clutch goals for us. He's been very good on the on the penalty kill. He's got a, got a lot of shorthanded goals along with Shane Fraser. But just really a, a player that sometimes when you play at that higher level and you don't get the ice time to develop, has to come back and just wants to play and yeah. contribute and be a part of a team. And that's what he's been able to do for us. And I know that um, the sign of a good player is not only when he can put up numbers, but he makes those players around him better. And that's what Reed has really done for Jack Hamley and Nicholas Leesburg. Uh, they've been a consistent line uh, for us for the majority of the year. He makes those guys better. So uh, Reed's been a, a great acquisition for us. Um, and again, another player that plays a huge role for us. Yeah, certainly some tough decisions for next year with uh, that group being uh, the 20-year-old. Uh, let's move to the, the decor, and, and a lot of people would say you guys have uh, the best or one of the best blue lines in the Alberta Junior Hockey League. It starts with uh, J.C. Thieverge, uh, Curtis Roach, uh, as well, uh, uh, I'm forgetting who, uh, Tanner, Miller. Tanner Miller, exactly. Uh, that's how many good guys that you have. <laughs> but just for those guys, you how would you describe your decor as a whole, but especially it's led by those guys with a, a very good veteran presence on the blue line that uh, you can really lean on those guys uh, for a lot of minutes, night in, night out? You can, and you know what? Um, as a coach, it's a luxury to have. It really is. And I think that some nights um, they'll dazzle you where you'll sit there and go, wow, mm -hmm. you know, can you believe that play? And the other ones, as you can tell by my hair, sometimes they, they make <laughs> you pull your hair out where, you know, just move the puck. But... Um, I think that we knew that we were going to have the strength on the back end and yeah. we feel that in today's game you have to be able to attack with four players. I mean attacking with three forwards is not enough. Um, so all of the successful teams in our league, the Brooks, the Okotoks, uh, Spruce Grove, those types of teams all have very mobile defensemen and I think that it was an area that we thought was going to be a strength for us. Unfortunately Curtis uh, broke his wrist and missed about six weeks um, otherwise I honestly feel that he'd be probably one of the leading scorers in our, in our league. Yeah. He's got, I believe it was going into this weekend, he had 23 points in 14 games, and I know that he's added some points on this weekend. But as a 20-year-old, as the leadership he brings, um, also J.C. Taverge, what he's done for us um, in both ends of the rink and also in our weight room, we always tell our guys at the start of the year as veterans, it's up to you to lead these young guys. Yeah. So when they're going out to work out and doing community work, pull a couple young guys with you so that they can learn what it takes to be an oil baron. And then, uh, you know, our ace in the hole really is Tanner Miller because he's still a 98. He can still be back next year. Just scored his 100th point this weekend, um, you know, has over 100, about 170 games um, under his belt. So, again, another Wiley veteran that we have. And great mentors for our young guys. So when you look at the, you know, the Ryan Conroys, who's a 2001 born, who's put up 14 points for us. Um, Gunnar Kinnenberg, uh, Lukas uh, Jovetic, um, those are also, that's the future of our organization and, and they don't have any better leaders than what the three guys we have on the back end. And I was, that was going to be my next question, how have they helped the young guys, but you just answered it there. Let's move on to goaltending. Two solid goaltenders for you. I mean, you have to have depth at goal uh, to succeed at the junior A level, it seems, uh, with any team that's at the top of the country in terms of uh, contending for league titles and, and national titles. But Eric Sudor has just been 
a, a rock for you guys. Maybe statistically not the best year compared to last year, but uh, he's just been solid. And, you know, the other night in Drumheller for you, 40 saves. And yeah. what I heard, the, the Dragons were just all over him. Yes. Uh, just talk about what Eric means and the way uh, Curtis uh, or Chris Kerr has come in and, and done an excellent job in relieving Eric uh, on several nights. Again, a luxury we have as a coaching staff when you've got a 1 and a 1A. And Eric... You know, you hit it right on the head. Had such a great year last year. Was a North Division All Star for us. Had had statistics that just you know blew your mind. And and as a coach, you're worried about you know could, can he really be better statistically? And when you don't get the numbers, um, then you automatically think, well, he's not as good. He's been even better for us this year. And believe me, you know sometimes teams have a really good record, and you think, okay, it's just a great team playing in front of your goaltender. And other times, it's you know it's you're good because of your goaltending. And I can honestly say that. They've saved our bacon a lot of times this year, and, and we wouldn't have a lot of the wins if it wasn't for Eric. And then, you know, on those games where you can give him a little bit of a rest and play Chris, yeah. um, he's just been lights out. I think he leads the league in a you know, saving percentage, yeah. um, has played probably more than what we had anticipated, but he's deserved that. And I think that we've got a healthy competition. There's sometimes a little bit of resentment, but uh, Eric understands. You know, when Eric broke into the league, he had Ravi Datani as his mentor and, and he learned from him, so now we expected Eric to do the same. And you know, because of Eric's play, he was you know able to obtain a, a full scholarship mm -hmm. to Alaska. So he's got you know his eyes on the prize for this year, but also for bigger and better things. And now Chris is going to be that player that we're going to rely on you know next year and the year after. And the goaltender that we bring in, he's going to have a good mentor in Chris Kerr. Surprise that uh, maybe maybe surprise not the not the word, but uh, with Eric committing to uh, Anchorage. Maybe I, you know, for me, I was surprised that maybe a higher Division One school either a, a didn't get him or maybe there was an interest. But uh, Alaska gets one heck of a pickup. Were you maybe a little taken back that there might have been a lack of interest, or just maybe touch on on that? I don't. I don't think it was a lack of interest. I think you know what people have to understand is that when you're going to obtain a full scholarship. There are several other factors that come yeah. into play, academics, athletics, and all those types of things. So Eric did have a lot of uh, interest, but you know what? At the end of the day, what we tell our players is uh, getting a scholarship is great, but make sure it's the right fit for you. Make sure you're going to be in a position where you can play. Make sure the, the schooling-wise that they offer the programs that you want, and just put yourself in a position where, where you have to think in three, maybe four years down the road, are you going to be able to play pro? Because that's what all these kids yeah. want to do. So Eric, after weighing you know, a couple offers that he had, felt that Alaska was... Um, you know the best option for him he actually just got back him and Chris Van Osha went on a fly down this last week Eric came back just with a huge smile on his face absolutely loved it loves that small uh, school type atmosphere yeah. um, where he's not going to get bombarded with these huge classes and I think it's just the right fit for him and I know that they've uh, they've got a great goaltender who's not only going to make their hockey team better but he's also going to make their program better as well well certainly Eric's done that for your program you took over a couple years ago from uh, Curtis Hunt uh, just touch on the process it's been taking this team from uh, 10 wins, fewest <laughs> in the league. You still made the playoffs, yeah, though. Yeah. Uh, fewest wins in one year to now being a contender once again, trying to get uh, another title in Fort McMurray, first time since 05, 06. Well, you, you know what? It was one of those things where I'm a Fort McMurray kid. Yeah. Uh, you know, I w wasn't born there, but I was raised and I lived my entire life in Fort McMurray. And I was very fortunate to coach with um, not only a mentor, but a very good friend of mine in Gore Thibodeau. And we established what we felt was a program that could consistently year after year con contend for yeah. a championship. And not only a championship, but also move kids to the next level. Because as coaches, we have to understand that I want Fort McMurray to be a stepping stone. Mm -hmm. So we not only want to develop our kids on the ice, but off the ice. Whether you're involved in the community, whether you're involved with your schooling, we want kids to be successful in life. Because we understand that they play hockey for us, but they're going to be friends. They're going to be husbands. They're going to be fathers a lot longer than what they're going to be hockey players. So for us, um, there was a little bit of a lull there. And when, when I, you know, accepted the job to, to come back, I knew it was going to be a tall task. I probably didn't uh, fully understand everything, but um, you know what? I think that with the support of a great board and an organization and the, the loyal fan base that we have in Fort McMurray, the most important thing for us was to have the big picture in mind. And, and I told the, you know, the board when they hired me there's going to be some growing pains here for a year yeah. and and to be quite honest I, I did not expect us to be that good last year but I thought that we had a three-year plan in place so now what's happening is we're just sort of right back to where we were in those mid-2000s yeah. where every year we want to be a contender um, it's a revolving door where we you know have some graduates from 20 year olds and we have some guys move on to scholarships but we have that, those young kids that are able to fill roles so uh, I appreciate the patience that the board had and hopefully we can be a contending team for a lot of years and what does it mean for the three-year guys that 
joined you on that, that, that first season that have been around now getting their opportunity, whether they're 20 year old or, or just they've played so long and gone through the process. What does that mean to have those guys still intact? Uh, you know, Eric being one of the guys, Will Conley, uh, as well as Miller and Frazier. Uh, just touch on maybe their growth uh, through the years and how exciting it is to potentially be playing for a championship this year. Well, it's ex extremely exciting. And you know what? I'm extremely appreciative of their patience with us. And, and at that first year, it would have been very easy for them to come and say, I don't want to be a part of this. I don't see where we're going. But they stuck with us, and, and they have provided the foundation for us. And I, I can't imagine a better quartet of guys uh, like Suter, like Will, like Fraser and Miller that you would want to build a team around. So, so we always talk about the young players always mimicking the leadership that they had when it's their turn to lead. And our young guys are going to be fantastic leaders when it's their turn to lead. And, and our success is a direct result of, of the hard work that our players put in, not only on the ice, but in dry land, off the ice. And, and you know, being a, uh, a player in the Alberta Junior Hockey League, it's not a part-time thing. Um, it really is a, a huge grind and through a 60 game schedule and all the travel that we have, um, you demand a lot of these players and, and we're very lucky to have the group that we have. Yeah, especially for you guys, get uh, a lot of miles on the road, that's for sure. A couple more questions for you. Uh, let's go back to last year. You've had some good battles with Gord Tubido over the years and last year uh, there was a few and just touch on uh, him getting the uh, the all-time coaches win uh, leading leading the victories uh, and, and winning that in uh, Fort McMurray Boy. obviously you're on the opposition <laughs> but just what did it mean to, to have Gore do that uh, in Fort McMurray you know I don't know whether it was poetic justice for it to happen in <laughs> yeah. Fort McMurray or it was just irony um, but obviously Gord and I have, have maintained you know a friendship and, and and I charted it through the year I knew and, and as we sort of got around Christmas him and I when we were talking I said you know it's about those games where we have quite Quite a few games at the end of the year with white court and he said yeah he said wouldn't it be something if it was in four mac and and you know it happened in overtime so i guess i guess it was good because we actually got a point he got the win he did it uh, in a building where he's cemented yeah. his legacy a a again as one of the all-time best coaches in the in the alberta junior hockey league i couldn't have been happier for him uh, he deserves all the accolades yeah. he'll never want them and, he and he'll deflect um you know the praise that he gets but he truly is somebody that i look up to not only as um, how to coach, but also just how to deal with, with players. And I think that's maybe the biggest thing that people don't understand is that Gord, through the 20-odd years that he's been coaching, has always stayed ahead of the game, how to deal with players. And there was a time where you were allowed to be harder on players and demand more. Now, uh, maybe so not much. so much. You have to be a little bit more of a psychologist. And Gord has been able to have success at every um, place where he's coached. And that's a testament to, you know, to his ability to not only coach the X and O's, but also to read players as well. Everyone talks about the atmosphere in Fort McMurray. Uh, describe it for us. You know, you get to see it firsthand. Uh, probably pretty, you know, it's one of the top, not only junior A atmospheres, maybe all of junior hockey atmospheres in the country. It really has. And you know what, the, the interesting thing for us as an organization is the demographics of our crowd has really changed. Where probably five, six years ago when oil was flowing yeah. freely and the economy was booming, we had a lot of, you know, our oil workers at games. And, and you know, it's just such a great place to play because... Um, you're the big ticket in town. There's, no, there's nothing really else in, in Fort McMurray. Now what's happened over the last three, four years is we, we've sort of um, channeled our, our energy to the families. And now the family atmosphere yeah. is really evident in our, in our crowd. So now we have to do the right thing and, and market towards, towards them. But, you know, when those playoffs get going and you're playing hockey in March and in April, uh, and that's a full building and, and uh, you get, uh, you know, 2,000, we'll call them Easterners, yeah. um, and you you have the alcohol going and the popcorn, it really is a great place. And, and as a player, you couldn't want for, for anything else. Is, and that's one of the things when we recruit players, you know, we tell our guys, this is a great yeah. building to play in. When it's great when you're winning and not so great when you're losing, but really the fans in Fort McMurray, all they really want is a, is a group of guys that are honest, hardworking players. And that's the type of team that we put try and put on the ice each and every night. And you, do you mentioned family, correct me if I'm wrong, but your daughter gets to sing the national yeah. anthem a few times. Yeah. What's that like uh, on the bench? Obviously, you're, you're dialed in, focused for uh, the game ahead, but uh, having your daughter sing the national anthem at home games has got to be pretty special. It is, and she's she's so good at it and, and into the drama and into the arts. And, you know, I've got three great children. Um, Maya's 14 and, and Max is 12 and Carter's 10. And, you know, they I like to come to all the games. They like to listen to the post-game shows. I mean, we win, and then the next morning they'll say, well, Dad, how do you think uh, you guys played? I said, well, did you listen to the yeah. interview? And they'll say, well, okay, we thought you played well, but you didn't really sound all that happy. But, you know, to have my family part of it you know we all realize as coaches we can't do this job unless you've got that support of a family and I've got a very loving and a supportive wife Erin um, she allows me to go on recruit
recruiting trips and on road trips. And, you know, really, as a father, you understand that it's not about the quantity of time, it's the quality time that you get to spend. And, and when my daughter gets to come and belt out the national anthem, it's great. And my kids are in the corner at every game, so I know that as soon as I get off the ice, they're ready there for yeah. fist bumps. Makes you feel good. All right, uh, lastly, uh, down the stretch here, final 10th of the season. Uh, you guys are playing well. We mentioned six wins in, in a row heading into this Sunday afternoon game against Sherd Park. You get four against Whitecourt. So we mentioned that the battle against Gord. <laughs> it, is first place still on the horizon? You guys think you can catch Bruce Gore, but you just want to finish the best possible spot you can and be ready to go for that uh, first round, maybe second round if you, if you get the luxury. Listen, I'm not going to lie. Obviously, as a coach with the internet nowadays, you're always looking at the standings and you're hypothesizing if they do this. And really, at the end of the day, we worry about what we can control. And we've got, um, you know, nine games left um, against all North Division opponents. It's going to get us ready. The last four games of the regular season are against Whitecourt which again is hopefully going to get us battle tested for playoffs. So whether we finish first, second, third, it, it doesn't really matter to us. You have to be ready to play. And I think that the parity in our league has never been more evident as it is this year. When you've got the, you know, the Bonnevilles who are playing well, Lloyd Minster streaking right now, Short Park's a very dangerous team to play against. I mean, anybody can really honestly beat anybody. Yeah. So for us, it's about being healthy, making sure that all of our guys understand the systems and that we're playing to the best of our ability because you're going to have to play your best in order to be successful. Well, Tom, thanks a lot for taking the time before a big game here in Sherd Park. Really appreciate you joining us here on the Canal to Hotels AJHL. Coach's show is a great, uh, a great conversation, so good luck the rest of the way, and we really appreciate uh, you joining us today. Well, thank you, and thank you for all that you do for the AJHL. All right, more Canal to Hotels AJHL Coach's show as the season winds down here in 2718. Stay tuned on the league's YouTube page.